Well, good evening or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Welcome to this month's edition of the Cleveland Clinic London COVID-19 webinar series. I'm Jim Gutierrez, Cleveland Clinic London's Chief of Quality, Safety, and Patient Experience, and I'll be serving as the moderator for our session today. I'm currently working back in Cleveland, and I'm in the room where we started this webinar series over a year ago. And I don't think any of us expected at that time that we still would be talking about COVID and it would be still dominating the news and dominating healthcare the way it continues to in June of 2021. As both the US and the UK are doing a fantastic job of rolling out vaccinations, and as we're seeing, the in illness rates and the hospitalization rates going down in both of our countries, we're learning more and more uh, and realizing the significance of the topic that we're going to be speaking about today, long COVID. We have three experts from Cleveland Clinic and Cleveland Clinic London who are going to be talking about various aspects of long COVID. We're joined today by Kristen England, who's the Vice Chair of Infectious Disease at Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, and also the Director of the Recover Clinic, which cares for patients with long COVID. Anant Patel, who's a Clinical Lead for Respiratory Medicine at Cleveland Clinic London, as well as serving at the Royal Free Hospital in London. And Nick Losa, who is our Medical Director for Global Patient Services and Strategic Alliances at Cleveland Clinic London, and who is a neurologist and a member of our neurology staff. Before we get started today, just a few ground rules. We, we will be recording today's webinar, so if you would want to watch it again or share it, you'll have that opportunity. Also, after each of our speakers has a chance to talk about their topic, we'll have an opportunity to address questions uh, from the audience, so please feel free to share those via the chat function. I'll now th turn things over to Kristen England, who is going to start and to, um, who is going to start us off speaking about long COVID. Kristen. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, Jim, for uh, inviting me to this. And I'm really impressed with all the people who are signed on right now because I understand that there is a pretty significant football match going on that uh, that we're competing with. So thank you for your time and uh, dedication to watching this at this point. So yes, I'm tasked with kind of introducing everyone to long COVID, or as you'll hear, the post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2, also called PASC. So, so many different names for this, long haulers and uh, a variety of things, but these are some of the names that you're going to be seeing mostly. Next slide, please. So we've been hearing about long COVID pretty much since uh, you know early in or mid 2020. Uh, studies were coming out of China uh, as early as January of 2021, where 76% of all of their patients who had been hospitalized had at least one persistent symptom. They found that it was pretty evenly split between men and women and a little older age, but one in five patients who had not required oxygen still had decreased lung function six months later. Coming from the UK, uh, in November of last year, they reported on young low-risk patients who still had signs of damage in one or more organ systems four months after their hospital or after their COVID diagnosis. And as you can see, only 18% of, of those uh, patients had even been hospitalized. So it, we're starting to see this trend that it's not just folks who were sick enough to get into the hospital who had persistent illnesses that, that you might expect if they had clear, clearly found lung damage or, or heart damage or other organs, but it's people who never even were sick enough to go into the hospital, and yet they're struggling with this six, eight, 12 months later. When you look coming from all different parts of the world, France, the Faroe Islands, and, and Switzerland, a third of those patients who had, again, mild acute symptoms, two to four months later, were still having symptoms, and almost three quarters of them reported a new symptom. And at the, uh, the Ohio State University, 15% uh, of competitive athletes were showing evidence that their cardiac muscle or their, their heart muscle had had some evidence of having some inflammation, even though they had had very mild symptoms. <clears throat> 
So it's affecting all organs, all ages, people hospitalized, and those not. Next slide, please. So long COVID is something that we're certainly seeing in the United Kingdom as well. This recently came out just uh, five or six days ago, estimated that more than 2 million people in England may have suffered from long COVID. So in this was a, a self-reported survey, but they found that 37% of people who said they had experienced COVID had at least one symptom lasting 12 weeks or more. And almost 15% had three or more symptoms at 12 weeks. Here they, they found it was more common in women uh, and with increasing age, but we're seeing a little bit of some differences in, in each of these studies, depending upon who they are um, polling at the time. Things that were linked with having long COVID symptoms were um, higher weight, uh, smokers, low incomes, those who have a chronic illness, and if you were hospitalized, then you were more likely to have symptoms. But tiredness, just generalized fatigue, is one of the things that we are seeing universally across these patients with long COVID. Next slide. So this came out early on, uh, August of, of last year, talking about the symptoms. And as you can see on the left side of the graph, those are the acute phase. So when people are acutely sick, so they they just had their COVID symptoms and they're often having fatigue and, and shortness of breath and cough and maybe some chest pain, but a lot of other symptoms, headaches, body aches, lack of appetite. But on the right side, you can also see that that fatigue persists and is the number one symptom that patients are presenting with. But patients do still have shortness of breath, cough, chest pain, and a whole variety of symptoms that go along with this. One of the things that we're also seeing that was less reported at that time and we're seeing more now is this difficulty with thinking and concentration referred to as brain fog. And I think uh, one of our esteemed panelists will be discussing that uh, in, a, in a short little while. Insomnia, trouble with sleeping. I'm hearing from my sleep colleagues that that is also something that we're seeing significant uh, challenges with. Next slide, please. So this has got international recognition. Everybody's heard of Dr. Fauci here, and he held a workshop uh, about six months ago and said, we need to be looking at this. The World Health Organization is on board with it. In the UK, obviously, uh, the national health system has launched at least 40 long COVID clinics. And here in the United States, there are also a wide variety of uh, of clinics that have opened up to try and address this, whether it be clinically and also from a research perspective. So next slide. So potential long COVID patients, why do we need to look at this? So we talked about the fact that it's probably 30% at least of patients with long COVID, but let's assume only 10%. Let's just say it's even a small number that, that we really need to be addressing this. Worldwide, that's almost 18 million patients who will be dealing with long COVID. Here in the United States, we're well over 3 million. In the United Kingdom, as I said, I'm underestimating this because I said it's probably a half a million in the United Kingdom where the previous article was estimating it somewhere closer to 2 million. So this is really something that we're gonna have to address from a, a, a patient standpoint from an economic standpoint, because when folks are feeling poorly from their long COVID, it really impacts their ability to work, their ability to take care of their children, and it certainly adds a, a cost and a stress to our already kind of challenged uh, medical system right now dealing with the problems of acute COVID. Next slide, please. So, in the United Kingdom, uh, there are a number of long COVID uh, clinics that have been opened. And as you can see, they're all throughout uh, various parts of the United Kingdom. And then there's also another 12 sites that are looking to be launching in various places. So thankfully, the National Health Service has really taken this uh, on directly uh, and will be addressing this. And, and now what we have to do as clinicians uh, is figure out how best to take care of you uh, and those uh, and, and all of your loved ones. Next slide, please. 
So what we started here in Cleveland is the Recover Clinic with the COV and the Center for COVID. Okay, my daughter helped me to plan this one out. So I give her all the credit, it's not me. So what we have is we have a Center for COVID Recovery that hopefully gives patients state-of-the-art diagnostic plans, evidence-based treatment, and research opportunities. We're only taking patients right now that have a positive COVID test by PCR. And that's really important because as a new entity, we really want to make sure we're looking at just COVID. We don't want to be dealing with folks who may be dealing with other long-term illnesses that, that is going to really make it difficult for us to make sure that we're, we're identifying this and figuring out how best to treat patients. Long COVID is identified as anybody with 28 days, uh, with, with symptoms beyond 28 days uh, after their diagnosis. So for one, we want to make sure that they're not still dealing with the acute symptoms, but also when they're coming into our clinics, we need to make sure that they're not infectious and, and at a risk for anybody else, giving anybody else this disease. So that's where the 28 days comes out. So what we developed is an entry point and then 18 different specialty care paths for patients to go down. So next slide, please. So what we did is we have a central clinic where we have patients come in to get evaluated. We give them a number of different evaluations even before they show up at the door, looking at things like whether there's anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress disorder dealing with this and sleep issues and neurocognitive or, or just uh, memory and concentration issues. So they fill out those forms before they even come in to see one of our practitioners. Once we go through another series of evaluations, looking at the heart and the lungs um, and, and uh, blood work, um, we then get patients into any of these number of specialists who have signed on board to be specialists in, in long COVID. So why do we do such a broad evaluation? Well, as we said, the number one reason that patients tend to show up is fatigue. And what causes fatigue? There are so many different things that can lead into that. So I can't tell you that your fatigue is not being caused by the fact that you don't have enough oxygen in your bloodstream, or you're not getting enough sleep, or you've got uh, vitamin and, and nutritional deficiencies. So we really have to start broad. Uh, and then to try to learn so much more about this. And frankly, I, I don't think we're gonna come up with any one magic pill or any one magic specialty path for patients. Everybody is presenting so differently and they need their own special care path to be able to, to, to work through and get themselves back to a healthy functioning um, lifestyle. Next slide, please. I looked at the first 113 just within the first month of patients being here just so I could get an idea that we were encompassing all of the things that we want. I'm hopefully going to be getting data on the next 350 patients soon, so we'll be giving an update. But as you can see on the left side, mostly patients were presenting with fatigue. There's this brain fog. There is certainly a high number of pulmonary symptoms, and with that, it was mostly exertional shortness of breath. So they go out for a walk and just just feel that they were short of breath or, or maybe having a persistent cough. And, and again, Dr. Patel is gonna be giving you more information on that, but at least this gave me some idea that yes, we're looking at the right organ systems, but my goodness, then we still have folks who are having problems with a loss of sense of smell and taste and, and diarrhea and, and headaches and even heat and cold intolerance. So there was no way to really pick out any one or two specialties. This is really involving the whole gamut and all of the organ systems of patients. Over on the right side, we were looking at folks who, who the, I know those numbers may not mean anything, but we're looking at people who are quite fatigued having difficulty with, with their memory uh, issues, a lot of sleep issues, and frankly, some anxiety and depression mixed in there as well. So whether that was underlying or whether COVID is now bringing this out, as it is in most people around the world, that's probably a big part of it. Next slide. So everyone's journey is unique. As I mentioned, there's no single clear definition of long COVID as of yet. And there's no clear single cure at this point. So we need to take a look at each and every patient and make sure that we're meeting you or your loved ones at your needs uh, to help you to get to where you need to be. Next slide, please. So 
this is just an idea of one of the specialty care pests that we have. So when I had a cardiac patient or I have patients coming in with either heart palpitations or when they stand up, they get dizzy. Um, and that has to do with their being able to adjust their, their uh, autonomic system. We get them to the cardiologist and they've developed specific care paths so that we can help to evaluate each and every one of these patients. And, and each of our specialties has developed something this in depth to be able to help. Next slide, please. We're gonna talk uh, a little bit about I'm not going to go into details, but why does this involve every organ system that you can see? As you can see on the left-hand side, there is that red um, virion, so the SARS-CoV, and we've all heard about the spike protein that the vaccine marks against. Well, that spike protein logs onto or latches onto our cells via something called an ACE receptor. And those ACE receptors are in every, almost every single organ in the body, as you can see on the right. So it can affect the kidneys and the heart and the eyes and the upper airway. So it's important that we look again at the overall global picture of your health uh, because this virus, unlike many different viruses, can affect a tremendous amount. Next slide. So some of the cardiac manifestations, and again, I know our, our my esteemed colleagues will speak about a couple of others, but because of those receptors on the cells, that ACE2 receptor, some organs can be impacted more than others. So we can see some inflammation of the heart muscle. We can see irregular heart rhythms called arrhythmias. And as I alluded to before, that postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, also called POTS, where people, as they start to stand up, can't adjust their heart rate and their blood pressure to be able to not get dizzy and, and, and have their blood pressure go down. So all of these are clear cardiac manifestations of, of long COVID that we're seeing in our patients. Next slide. GI as well, uh, we can see inflammation of the gut because there are so many ACE receptors in the gut. As a result of all of that inflammation, we're also getting a lot of changes in the bacterial flora that's there. And there's also problems with immotility. So people's bowels are not working as well or they're working too much and they're having diarrhea. So we see a lot of problems with constipation and diarrheal illness. And, and then again, all of the, the bacterial changes that are ongoing that can cause patients a lot of distress. Next slide. So our goals for what we are doing here at our Recover Center of Excellence is to help each patient recover meaningly from their long COVID journey. We have specialty teams. We're gonna be collaborating hopefully on research with others here in the United States and across the world, including the UK. We're gonna be contributing to our central COVID database to learn more about this disease, not only on the individual basis, but on an overall basis, and then hopefully being able to get that information out so that we can all learn and get this taken care of a lot more quickly. Next slide, I think that's it. Now I can't wait to hear from my next colleagues, Dr. Gutierrez, I'm gonna pass it on back to you. Hey, thanks, Kristen. Um... Fantastic coverage of long COVID. I think those numbers, even if they're conservative, are staggering that you provided. Um, and it's also um, quite amazing to hear and understand why it affects so many organs. Um, so uh, next we're gonna hear from um, two of our Cleveland Clinic London specialists on some specific disease system manifestations for long COVID. First, we'll hear from Anand Patel, who is a chest medicine, a pulmonary specialist at both Cleveland Clinic London and the Royal Free. Anant, you've been on the front lines of the battle against COVID from day one, and you'll be speaking to us about how long COVID affects the lungs. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Kristen, for a, a, an excellent talk. Next slide, please. So when people talk about uh, COVID and long COVID, things can get a bit muddled. So I thought I'd just try and clear up what I'll refer to within this talk, where COVID-19 in the acute phase, that means just in the first few weeks from the first time that someone develops symptoms to four weeks later, we will refer to that as acute COVID. And then the kind of medium term ongoing symptomatic COVID-19 between four and 12 weeks later, 
where most symptomat most patients with ongoing symptoms, if you look really hard enough in the in the organ systems in which you look, sometimes you find that the virus is still around and it may be a persistent lingering infection in some of those people. And then there's something that's referred to by many people as a post-COVID-19 syndrome. That's more than 12 weeks after the initial symptom onset. So four months, uh, three months later. Um, and as you've heard from Kristin, that, 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 can, that can go on for, for many, many months beyond that too. Next slide, please. What I'll refer to as long COVID um, is the, the latter two. So from four weeks onwards, uh, and that in the, in the UK literature at least is what most people refer to as long COVID for the time being. But the reason I refer back to acute COVID-19 is because what happens in the first few weeks and sometimes in the first few days does impact a bit on what happens particularly in the lung in terms of ongoing symptoms after four weeks. Next slide, please. And so we're used to, in respiratory medicine, dealing with patients who've got problems all around their bodies, with their lungs often at the centre of the problem. Patients, for example, with smoking-related lung disease have weak bones as a result of that, have cardiovascular disease often linked with that. We have patients who have um, florid inflammatory problems within the lungs that affect lots of other parts of the body. So this is, I think, new people often for, for millennia have known that when, when you feel unwell, for example, with flu, you feel generally unwell. It's not just a, an airway problem. It's not just a lung problem. And COVID-19 has shown us that in, in, a, in a very stark way, how coronavirus affects uh, large portions of the body, as Christian's referred to. And the lung... Uh, is probably the epicenter of, of the, the kind of factory that produces the viruses, although they can replicate in all of those places where Christian showed that ACE receptors are, are expressed. Uh, and so starting from the top of the body, the brain and the lungs are connected uh, via long nerves. And that's really important because uh, what happens in the brain often makes people feel less or more breathless. It can often uh, lead to uh, a heightened sensitivity to cough, for example, and, the, and those breathlessness and cough are the two most uh, common symptoms uh, when it comes to long COVID in the lung. Uh, patients who've got weak muscles and general fatigue in their muscles and joints actually often feel very breathless as well, particularly when they're out and about walking, trying to exercise and trying to perform to a higher phys physical standard again. And the kidneys and the lungs are really important uh, working in tandem to control how acidic or alkaline the blood is. And what happens in the kidneys certainly affects how breathless people can feel and what happens to the sense of breathing as the body tries to balance its, uh, its carbon dioxide and its acidity. Next slide, please. So I'd like, to, I'd like you to think of the, the lungs or the respiratory system overall in three broad compartments. One is the tubes. And that starts really at the nose and the mouth all the way down to uh, the small tubes that branch off uh, deep down inside the lungs that you can see in, in the left-hand part of the cartoon. And on the right-hand part of the cartoon, you can see that there's a kind of a lobulated structure, which is called a, an alveolus or an air sac is the common term for it. And the air sacs are really important in our, in our breathing because they're the, they're the areas of the lungs that expand and contract where gas fills and empties in and out of the lungs. And the reason why gas comes in and out of, the, of those structures is because, so the air sacs being another compartment and the third compartment being the blood vessels that envelop those, uh, those air sacs. If you look in the top right of the cartoon, you can see that the alveoli are covered in these blood vessels, all designed to take in oxygen from the outside world, deposit that into the bloodstream to be taken away to the rest of the body, and then get rid of the waste gases that we also produce from our bodies to be breathed out again into the outside world. Next slide, please. So the three compartments being the tubes, the air sacs, and, uh, and the blood vessels within the lungs. So if we just focus on the tubes to begin with, the, 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 the cells that line most of the airways have these kind of long filaments to them. These are called cilia. People, often people will think of them as hair-like. And this is an extreme magnification of human airway cells which have been deliberately infected in a laboratory with coronavirus to see what it looks like. And you can see here that all of those very small particles that you can see in the right-hand panel are individual virus particles. Um, and so you can see that they're, they're in absolutely huge numbers. Uh, this is 96 hours after these cells were in, deliberately infected. In the left-hand panel towards the right-hand part of the image, you can see those kind of long um, structures. That's mucus on the inside of those airways. Now, mucus on the inside of the airways causes cough uh, in, in a big way, 
And with that number of virus particles, that's going to cause a big influx of cells of the immune system into the airway compartment itself and, and worsen the cough. And when immune cells come into the airway, they, leave, they can leave behind some chemical um, damage to, to those airways that has sometimes short-term, sometimes medium, and sometimes long-term consequences, either by physically affecting the, the inside lining of the tubes, sometimes by affecting the way that the nerves work, the cough receptors work uh, inside the tubes. Next slide, please. The way that most viruses um, affect, or many airway viruses uh, affect the inside of the airway is quite nicely seen on this series of, of very highly detailed, uh, highly magnified images. So in an uninfected patient, this is a, a virus other than coronavirus, but just here for demonstration of, of what it can look like. You can see that those, those cilia, those long uh, filaments are there, they're healthy. They tend to work together and they brush dust and particles uh, and even uh, infectious particles up and up into the upper airway where they can be cleared from the throat or coughed up. And after they've been infected, you can see that the airway is what we call denuded, where these hairs are essentially cut down by day eight, often at the peak of somebody's viral illness. You can see that it's almost like a, a mown lawn, for example. So you, the, the, a person with an airway virus has really lost their ability to clear the secretions, clear the particles, and, and opens it up to other uh, infectious agents. So uh, for example, bacterial infections that happen after a, a, an airway virus is really very common. That happens in the more severe end of the COVID spectrum, often in hospitalized patients. We haven't seen lots of evidence of that in the context of patients that have COVID in the community that do not require hospitalization. Um, but you can see here at day 12 and day 21, those, those structures have regrown and come back. And in most respiratory viruses, that does happen. Whether that happens or not in COVID is unknown and whether there's an impairment of that healing causing a persistence of symptoms is, is an open question and something that needs to be looked into. Next slide, please. And so we'll move on to the second compartment I talked about, the air sacs. Now this is a CT scan, a computed tomograph of, uh, of through the middle of someone's chest. And in the middle, there are a, a big white structure, which are blood vessels. You can see two oval black shapes. Those are the main airways. Um, and then there's two kind of oval dark shapes with lots of dots and lines in them. Those are the lungs. And this is someone who was picked up incidentally to have COVID. They didn't have any symptoms, but actually the air sacs are the, really the first place where these viruses, often a place where these viruses take hold, where they uh, replicate. Uh, and the kind of whitish fluffy shadowing that we're seeing where the red arrows are, are areas of inflammation where immune cells and the virus particles have kind of congregated in areas causing shadowing on the lungs. And that's reasonably correlated with, with symptoms. And in particular, when air sacs are affected by any process, it can make people feel breathless. Next slide, please. And since it's someone who's affected by COVID in a much more severe way, you can see that those kind of uh, fluffy white areas have changed in this particular individual into some uh, more uh, confluent white areas. And this in the context of COVID can be uh, some of the above or all of infection, inflammation, and what we call fibrosis or an abnormal uh, response to uh, healing from an infectious or an inflammatory insult to the lungs. So scarring of the lungs, inflammation and infection probably all play uh, various types of roles in different groups of people in, within individuals as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the air sacs are a real, a real area where there's a, a big problem uh, that can persist for weeks and months on end afterwards as well. Um, for most people, that those areas of infection, inflammation, CT scans tend to look better and better as, as time goes on. But in, in some people, there are some persistent changes of, of lung scarring that stays for a long time. And then I said the third compartment is the blood vessels within the lungs. And the, some of those blood vessels are quite large. And you can see there's a big white stripe within the, uh, the left-hand panel that you can see there of a, a CT scan. In blue writing, you might be able to see that it's small. In small writing, it says acute PE. That stands for pulmonary embolism. That's a blood clot uh, that has formed somewhere else potentially and then come into the lung and got lodged within the blood vessels of the lung. That can be there in the short term and in most people with appropriate identification and treatment that will go away. But it can be that if that goes unidentified and that happens probably reasonably commonly in patients who are uh, in the community with their infection and don't have a CT scan at the time of their worst symptoms, where we may not pick up some, some of these blood clots and they can then persist and become uh, longer term and can contribute to breathlessness as well. 
and that can happen in large airways, which, uh, sorry, large blood vessels, which is in the left-hand panel, it can happen in smaller blood vessels and be more difficult to identify uh, as is happening in the right-hand panel. And it can even certainly happen with inflammation and clots forming in some of the very, very tiny blood vessels, those that were wrapping around the air sacs that we saw in the cartoon earlier. And that can certainly cause ongoing symptoms, ongoing breathlessness. And whether a blood thinner should be a part of our thought process when we're dealing with patients who are left with lots of breathlessness afterwards uh, probably needs to be judged after some further investigation, but can form part of the treatment plan. Next slide, please. And so some of the tests that we would uh, do to identify um, what uh, of the airways, the air sacs or the blood vessels uh, may be affected, maybe uh, be able to, we might be able to identify those causes a bit more easily uh, with some investigation. Uh, and in particular, breathing tests that you can see in the top left panel, uh, where the patient's got uh, a clip on his nose and breathing into a tube, which gives us an idea of airflow. Uh, we can do tests to see how efficient the air sacs are, are, uh, are taking oxygen into the bloodstream and removing carbon dioxide into the outside world. In the top right panel, you can see a, a patient lying down flat and going through a, a big ring of a machine, a CT scanner, uh, and that produces the type of images that we saw that can show us what's happening within the air sacs and what's happening within the blood vessels. And then, of course, some blood tests, and some of those are helpful in identifying if there's uh, ongoing inflammation and potentially some other secondary infection that may be happening, for example, in the airways, and give us an idea of whether there may be ongoing clot formation uh, in the blood vessels as well. Next slide, please. So what can we do for patients who have ongoing symptoms? Well, as uh, Dr. England said, that there's, uh, there's no one magic bullet for this, and it's very, very much individualized, and therefore, we need time as healthcare professionals to spend with patients and their loved ones to really kind of get to the root of what's affecting them and thinking about how best that we can do it. And unfortunately, really, the, the kind of thing that's proved most effective at the moment is time. But there are some, there's emerging evidence that, that, that parts of what we are able to deliver, particularly in the form of exercise and rehabilitation, which has a multitude of benefits, not just within the lung or with respiratory symptoms, uh, can help. Speech and language therapy, for example, some specific breathing exercises for people with a particular type of breathlessness. There, are, there is some evidence about whether having an inhaled steroid, such as, uh, such as taken in the context of asthma, may be helpful. I've got colleagues who uh, swear by tablet steroids, but the, the evidence for, for using that in this uh, group of patients is probably at the moment quite slim. And whether there's a, a more specific way of being able to modulate a patient's immune system is probably something that may be more helpful in the future. Blood thinners, as I've mentioned, if, if blood clots are a feature on the investigations, Really interestingly, uh, as, uh, anecdotally, many many of you may have heard this as well, that after patients have long COVID symptoms and then receive vaccination, actually uh, what's been reported uh, by people anecdotally and in some surveys is that they feel better. And so uh, there was a survey of about 4,000 people in the UK uh, that suggested that 57% of people after having had a vaccination, at least a week after the vaccination, had some improvement in their symptoms. A step change is what's being described rather than an ongoing gradual improvement. So whether or not there's an underlying mechanism that the vaccination is uncovering that we need to think about in uh, in more detail is, is certainly going to be something that, that researchers and clinicians will look at very heavily in the future. Thank you. Well, thanks, Anant. Um, that was terrific. I think those images that you shared with us really help us understand why um, these symptoms really stay with patients for so long. Um, I'm going to turn things now over to my colleague, Nick Losef. Uh, Nick, as I said, is uh, one of our neurologists at Cleveland Clinic London. He's also been on the front lines of the pandemic at the University College uh, Hospital Queen Square facility. Uh, and he's going to be speaking to us about how long COVID affects both uh, the neurological system as well as creates psychiatric manifestations. Nick? Thanks very much, Jim, uh, for asking me to contribute to this. Uh, I'm going to cover how and where COVID affects the nervous system. And a bit like an ant, actually, it kind of starts with a front end view or short COVID, if you like, because it's clearly what happens at this point, uh, which is going on to forget and cause. Uh, persistent long COVID symptoms. Uh, next slide, please. 
So, I mean, since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there was an immediate concern that survivors might be at an increased risk of neurological disorders. Uh, and that's uh, initially based on findings actually from other coronaviruses, uh, but was then followed rapidly by medical case series documenting evidence of COVID involvement of the brain, and also by an understanding by, you know, the, me the mechanisms by which this could occur. And similar concerns were raised regarding psychiatric sequela, uh, with evidence showing that survivors were indeed at an increased risk of mood and anxiety disorders in the three months uh, after infection. Of course, there's a, there's a very artificial line between what's psychiatric and what's neurological. And I don't particularly care for the distinction because both symptomatologies come from disorders of the brain and psychiatric symptoms, anxiety and depression are very common in people with neurologic disorders and indeed actually slightly the other way around, even neurologic symptoms can be seen in patients with psychiatric disorders. But it's all the brain, whether it's the hardware of the brain or it's the software of the brain, there's a common underpinning to these things. So next slide please. So 30% um, of people who were requiring hospitalisation and 85% of people who had severe lung disease were showing neurological symptoms and signs. And in patients with mild COVID, neurological symptoms are mostly confined to you know, non-specific abnormalities such as malaise, dizziness, headache, loss of smell and taste, some of which is routinely observed in respiratory virus infections such as the flu, or is much higher with COVID. And serious neurological complications uh, were being also reported in patients with otherwise mild COVID. Uh, but nevertheless, the most severe complications were occurring in critically ill patients. And this is not surprising. Uh, neurological manifestations have also been long described in infections from other respiratory viruses, including other coronaviruses. So next slide, please. In terms of the biologic plausibility of this, and Kristen has talked about uh, the mechanisms by uh, which COVID uh, attaches itself and enters the body. Um, the first thing is there, there's a various routes by which COVID can directly enter the brain. So loss of smell, as we know, is a frequent neurological manifestation of COVID. Uh, and in fact, there was early evidence that some patients were showing abnormalities on MRI brain scans in the sort of the olfactory cortex. So this is the perceptual part of the brain that interprets smell that's been delivered to it down the olfactory nerve, the nerve that goes from the nose back into the skull. And on this picture on the left, it's a sort of front on view of the brain. You've got some arrows pointing at some white signal there, uh, which is some sort of inflammation or dysfunction of that part, the smell cortex part of the brain, and that's shown in a horizontal section on the right-hand side. That's a study from Politi in uh, JAMA. Next slide, please. So in addition to that direct route in, and that route in of the olfactory nerve is seen actually with some other viruses as well. Uh, there's other potential routes for COVID to enter the brain. So there is a physical mesh of cells that surrounds the brain and provides a barrier between it and the, and the blood called the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and this is another common route of entry into the brain of blood-borne viruses. Uh, next slide, please. So viruses can also enter the brain uh, being carried in by infected immune cells. In fact, immune cells do regularly cross the brain blood brain barrier and enter the brain and provides immune surveillance of what's happening in the brain in normal uh, suspects in any case. Uh, next slide please. So in addition to the sort of direct entry of COVID into the brain, there also can be a whole lot of systemic sort of whole body factors that could also uh, indirectly affect the brain. And obviously if the lungs have been badly affected by COVID, 
this can lead to very severe level of testosterone in the blood. In fact, even changes consistent with something called hypoxic brain injury, which is where the brain is injured from critically low oxygen concentrations in the blood, sort of thing we only really see when people have a cardiac arrest. Uh, changes consistent with this hypoxic brain injury have been found in autopsy studies showing neuron damage in brain regions that are vulnerable to low oxygen and these include various thinking areas, the memory circuits, which are incredibly sensitive uh, pieces of kit, and the balance areas of the brain, which might explain one of the reasons why dizziness is such a common post-COVID symptom. And of course, COVID also damages other organs, including the kidneys, heart, liver, GI tracts, endocrine organs that we've heard. And that can result in metabolic changes, changes in water and the salt imbalance, hormonal dysfunction, accumulation of toxic metabolites. And these can also contribute to some of the more non specific central nervous system manifestations of the disease, such as confusion, agitation, headache, etc. So, as Anant mentioned, one of the key features of COVID has been a profound disorder of blood coagulation, which has often been responsible for some of the most frequent and harmful complications of the disease. In fact, my understanding is that studies have shown that up to 88% of patients have exhibited some evidence of a hypercoagulable state, an abnormal state of blood coagulation uh, in COVID populations. So my own uh, speciality within neurology is stroke medicine. Uh, next slide, please. I run a regional stroke centre based in central London uh, at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. And um, this was sort of personally fortunate in a way because I was not seconded into general ICU duties, proning the large number of uh, severely ill, hospitalised patients. And we were just left to get on with the stroke service. This, this was uh, remaining equally busy during the pandemic. Uh, and actually, from the outset, we were seeing patients with new forms of stroke. Now, stroke is not uncommon in patients hospitalised in COVID for other reasons, with reported rates from about 1% to 3% in hospitalised patients and up to 6% in critically ill patients. But we were seeing people present de novo with stroke as the only manifestation of COVID that had brought them into hospital. These are collections of scans showing different areas of the brain that have been damaged. Uh, these were quite unusual, a lot of these patients. Sometimes they've often had very mild COVID symptoms. Sometimes weeks before, they presented in this delayed fashion with very, very large blood clots uh, forming in the body and blocking arteries into the brain. Very, very distinct groups of patients with, again, profound evidence of blood coagulation abnormalities on blood tests. So, I mean, there's a huge world literature about this already, actually. I think I came across 2,000 papers or something that have been written about this uh, issue of uh, stroke and, and, and COVID. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the other neurological manifestations? Uh, well, they... Uh, involve both the brain and also the peripheral nerves. So we have the brain and the spinal cord, which we think of as the central nervous system, but then we have all the nerves that come out of the spinal cord and you know, basically go to your arms and leg. And these have all been affected. So I've said about the sort of non-specific mild abnormalities, uh, but lots of other serious neurological complications have been uh, also uh, seen as well. And these include both something called encephalopathy, which is a sort of syndromic term describing uh, basically alteration in mental status, such as confusion, disorientation, uh, but also encephalitis as well, where in fact there is evidence of direct infection of the brain uh, with the virus. Uh, a similar presentation, but also can in include epileptic fits but associated with abnormalities in spinal fluid examinations taken by lumbar puncture and also focal abnormalities on brain scans as well. Um, 
can have the next slide be? So this actually can present some months later. And this is a patient I actually saw last week, which is serendipitous for a talk about long COVID, because this was a young woman who'd had COVID some months ago, and slightly before she tested positive for by PCR, she had for the first time ever a meagerness type headache, sort of flashing lights, very bad headache. And subsequent to that, she had just had slightly poor concentration. And of course, everyone was saying, oh, this is long, long COVID. Um, in fact, this is a scan of the brain. On the, on the image on the left hand side, you can see in the centre there some sort of white, bright, white signals. That's in an area of the brain called the thalamus. It's a sort of deep central relay station. And if you damage it, you can get all sorts of problems, difficulties, concentration, sleeping, loss of volition, language disorders, sensory abnormalities, all sorts of things. And you know, this sort of very innocent presentation, a bit of headache followed by, I can't concentrate quite so well, but whether she could concentrate enough to go and do her job full time, whether she was struggling, is actually associated with visible kind of organic brain damage. And these abnormalities could have been the consequence of a stroke, it's possible, or these, this particular site is also uh, well described as a primary site of encephalitis in neurological involvement with COVID. So uh, things aren't always what they seem actually, and it sort of underpins this point that actually what is happening with long COVID is uh, sometimes very tangibly explained by what's happened in the acute phase. Uh, next slide, please. So we've also seen post-infectious neurologic com complications. So we know the virus itself kind of unleashes a dysregulated immune response and that can have delayed effects on the nervous system, affecting both the central part and the peripheral part of the nervous system. Uh, and some of the classic conditions that uh, we see with other viral infections have been seen in COVID. Uh, so in the peripheral nervous system, something called Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, which is uh, a situation where the body basically attacks itself after it's kind of dealt with the infection. It causes a sort of ascending weakness that can be anything from mild to very severe. Patients can end up re-ventilated in intensive care units for months with this. So we've seen this and we've seen other not direct infectious consequences in the brain, but post-infectious inflammatory consequences in the brain as well. Uh, next slide, please. So um, how does this translate into long COVID? So we've seen some of the mechanisms that can underpin symptoms in long COVID. And there are, you know, there's a lot of data now looking at six months neurologic psychiatric outcomes kind of detailed studies looking at the incidence of you know definable neurologic and psychiatric outcomes including stroke parkinsonism guillain barre syndrome various nerve muscle diseases encephalitis the direct infection of the brain dementia psychosis mood anxiety disorders substance use disorder insomnia as Kristen mentioned earlier, um, you know, this is a really, really big problem actually. So there's good surveillance data from about a quarter of a million patients who've been diagnosed acutely with COVID. The estimated incidence of neurological and psychiatric diagnosis in six months following was 33, 33%. And for patients who had been admitted to an intensive care unit, the estimated instance of one of these diagnoses is 46%. So there's really you know, evidence for substantial neurological and psychiatric morbidity in the six months after COVID infection. Uh, next slide, please. And there is another side to this, which is in addition to this sort of tangible underpinning that I've discussed, i.e. There's an abnormal brain scan, there's an abnormality in the spinal fluid or in the blood tests. 
there are of course lots of things that you don't see on scans so you've got lots of patients who don't have any clear clinical evidence of residual organ damage but still have very very severe symptoms that are affecting quality of life and affecting their ability to think to work and really to function for several months after the illness and as time has gone on with our own long covid clinic at the neurology hospital these are now the majority of patients in in long covid clinics but of course because you don't see something on the scan spinal fluid examination probably just reveals the relative insensitivity of the tests rather than anything else um, this group of patients you know Kristen has mentioned that symptoms already brain fog difficulty concentrating depression anxiety muscle pain fatigue this is all kind of be disabling actually particularly so as I think there's something that is more peculiar to neurologic conditions is that they're invisible because people look all right and people say to patients oh you look fine and there is nothing more disheartening actually the patient feels absolutely awful it's not actually they don't find it encouraging to be told they look fine they feel misunderstood actually and often not believe uh, that they have this burden it's a real problem and actually spending that time and creating some understanding of what's happened and also some realistic expectation as to how long this is all going to take to get better is quite challenging actually for for people next slide please so we've talked about i think everyone's got this point no magic bullet you've said no magic bullets and i've said no magic bullet singular there isn't actually because the treatment for all these things is largely supportive and actually rehabilitation based so management of fatigue fatigue is an incredibly common symptom of any neurologic condition be it long covid or whatever it is that's happened it's often a, a, a residual very damaging symptom even when people rec have recovered otherwise completely for example from a stroke and it's pretty much limited actually fatigue management is really limited to energy conservation doing a little amount not very often and resting and avoiding stress as well which really derails uh, fatigue indeed out of these in fact maybe depression is perhaps the easiest to manage with lifestyle cognitive psychotherapeutic approaches and medical approaches of course including antidepressants um, but there's you know there's a still a large amount to be learned uh, the very long-term consequences and prognosis of this are no and of course as has been said already there's another huge economic impact which is the inability to re-engage in work which at an individual and societal level is going to be huge. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Nick. Um, and thank you as well, Anant and Kristen. Um, fantastic job in covering your topics. It was terrific. Um, before we get to a few questions that have come in from our audience, I really just wanted to take a moment to call out that this is an, ex an especially exciting time for us at Cleveland Clinic London, as we are on the home stretch to seeing our first patient. Uh, our outpatient center at 24 Portland Place in the Harley Street area of London will be opening in just 10 weeks. So that's very exciting. And our hospital at 33 Grosvenor Place will actually be opening in about 30 weeks on January 31st of next year. So. We're really looking forward to the opportunity to finally be able to serve uh, patients in the United Kingdom. Um, we have had some questions come in. Uh, we might not have time to get to all of them. So uh, for those of you who have questions that aren't addressed, I will share them with our audience members and we will get back to you on, on, the, on, on them. But first of all, I think maybe this one might be most appropriate for Kristen. Uh, and others can weigh in. Probably uh, a, a scenario you're seeing some uh, in your practice. Um, an individual um, mentioned on the chat that they started with symptoms suggestive of COVID, um, but had a negative PCR test. That's the gold standard nasal swab test for COVID. Uh, but despite that, now for months have continued to have 
shortness of breath with exertion that limits their ability to run. This is an individual who's planning on running the London Marathon this autumn, but is having difficulty getting a mile in now. So, you know, Kristen, I know you mentioned that having a positive PCR is one kind of entry criteria for the recovery clinic, what recovery clinic. So maybe Kristen and then Anand, it'd be interesting to hear uh, any advice you might give to this individual. Well, I'm so sorry to hear uh, the debility uh, that this person is going through. You know, a, a, a positive COVID test is helpful when it's positive. Is it 100% accurate? No. So is there the possibility that you had COVID and the test just didn't come up positive? Absolutely. So whether it is you know defined as long COVID or whether we just define this as a probable viral illness of some other sort, you're still dealing with the debility. So if there was a antiviral medication that I could give you that was specific to COVID, then making that diagnosis would be terribly important. But I think right now, so much of it is, is going to be dealing with what Dr. Patel has been talking about as far as the pulmonary rehab and as far as trying to address the symptomatology right now. While I have limited the patients in my clinic to those with a positive PCR, I fully understand there are plenty of people likely with COVID who I'm not looking at, but I'm also trying to do this in, in a more uh, scientific rigor right now, just so that I can try and make uh, a, a clear definition about long COVID. But that doesn't minimize what you're going through just because we don't have the title for it. So I'll toss it to Dr. Patel as far as the pulmonary rehab issues go. Thank you, and I completely agree with everything you've said, Kristen. Um, I would add uh, a couple of things and agree no test is 100% just because the PCR test was negative doesn't mean necessarily that that definitely rules COVID out. Um, but the, the the couple of messages I would probably send to, to this person who's really suffering is grade your exercise don't push yourself too hard too soon you may have an aim for the marathon in the autumn but actually maybe you may be better served by doing the marathon the year after potentially depending on the trajectory of your symptoms and how you're feeling and actually doing little and often and not over stressing and overdoing it in the short term may be a better route to recovery and being able to live a better life often when patients with long covid really try and go for it and push themselves with exercise in particular they often feel then even more debilitated for days and days afterwards and then they may have taken one step forward but three steps back so a, a graded approach is something that seems to work um, and over time may, maybe there'll be more evidence about specific things that we can suggest the second thing i would say is that if they haven't already had it then have the vaccination um, uh, the evidence is, you know, the concern has always been that actually it may, may make people with long COVID feel worse. The evidence so far, although not entirely um, scientifically rigorous at the moment, the evidence so far is that actually may make people feel better. And actually protecting against a second round of infection, another variant uh, would be a very valuable thing to have because when you're feeling rotten, the last thing you want is another bout of, uh, of COVID. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you guys both. Great answers. I think we have about a minute, and I, this is um, perhaps uh, an appropriate, a, a good question. So maybe I'll, I'll throw this out to you, Kristen, and Nick, you might have a comment. This person is asking about how the fatigue experience with long COVID might be similar in physiology presentation and management to chronic fatigue syndrome. Any, any similarity or connection? I do think that our, that our immunology uh, researchers in world are very interested in this. I think there's been some research being done with chronic fatigue syndrome and, and because of the, just the, the, the non-concreteness of it, the, the fact that we have a virus now that, that causes such a similar syndrome uh, gives them hope that we're gonna be doing a lot more uh, research into the whole concept of, of chronic fatigue. Um, you know, we, we've looked at it for a number of different viruses and a number of different entities. And, and I, think, I think if there's any good outcome to COVID, it's going to be that we're gonna be studying this process um, a lot more. And sorry, just to Dr. Patel, thank you for talking about vaccines. I have seen patients with vaccines uh, with long COVID feeling better 
Um, and if there's anything that we can get out from today is that you don't want to have long COVID. This is not an end. You don't want to be coming to any of our clinics. For those of you who are young and think that, that getting COVID is going to be okay because you're not likely to end up in the hospital on a ventilator, you can get long COVID and it can be devastating. So please get vaccinated. That's my huge push. Fantastic. And, and that's really an appropriate final statement, Kristen. Thank you for sharing that. We have to continue to keep our guards up and do everything we can to protect um, basically ourselves and everybody that we're exposed to from COVID. So I want to thank, first of all, our speakers. Thank you all for your excellent coverage of the topic. And most importantly, thank you all in the audience for your time today. Um, I, I won't say I was peeking at the game, but it might have been nil-nil at halftime, um, perhaps. Uh, and again, this will be recorded, so it will be available if you want to share it with anyone you know um, who uh, wasn't able to attend today. Thank you all very much.